come just as you are. Hear the Spirit call, come just as you are. Come and see, come receive, come and live forever. strength for today. Taste the living water and never thirst again. Come just as you are. Hear the Spirit call. Come just as you are. Come and see Come receive, come and live forever, life everlasting and strength for today. Taste the living water and never thirst again. Come and receive. And strength for today. Taste the living water and never thirst again. Come just as you are. Hear the Spirit call. Come just as you are. Come and see. Come receive, come and live forevermore. Good morning, everyone. It's good to see you. Glad you're with us today. Can 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 you hear me? Am I on? Come on. All right, we got new microphones. What? Can you hear me? What, what if I move? Can, I just got to stand here now. It's good to be with you all. Can't wait to greet every one of you. All right. Technology, right? We love it, don't we? Oh, my goodness. All right. Yeah, so I got a new Britney Spears mic. I'm feeling very, you know, uh, right? Yeah, I'm ready to. to. <laughs> All right, you never know what you're going to get here at First Christian Church. <clears throat> well, it's good to see you all. Thanks for being here on this uh, third Sunday in the season of Lent. Let us know that you were here with us. Fill out that connection card, drop it in an offering plate. We're always grateful when you do that. Those of you that are with us, uh, still with us online, they're probably logging off right now. They're like, oh gosh, <laughs> we're out of here. <laughs> but if you're still with us, let us know that you're here with us. We're grateful when you do that too. Number of, uh, of announcements. Uh, big, uh, big day next Sunday here at First Christian Church. Uh, it is our uh, infamous Spaghetti and Skits. It is a spaghetti dinner and talent show next Sunday. Sunday evening, 5 o'clock, uh, we'll have dinner, and then uh, after dinner, we'll have that talent show. So if you haven't signed up to be a part of Skeddy and Skits yet, what are you waiting for? Don't wait any longer, because you know what's going to happen if we don't have enough acts, then you just get Chuck and me up there bantering and telling bad jokes and dancing and... You know, endless name that tuba tune. So, um, which we all love, right? Yes, we do. Uh, it's a great night. We support uh, our Christian education ministries. You get a dinner, a good show, some laughs, and uh, you just can't beat that for a few bucks uh, for everybody. So hope that you'll be a part of Skating Skits next Sunday. We got a number of things coming up here in March. We're finally to March, right? Finally got to March after February 43rd, and uh, finally tipped over to, to March, right? It was a long February. 
But uh, here we are in March, and by the end of March, we'll be celebrating uh, Easter, and um, before Easter, we'll have Palm Sunday and Holy Week. So do take note of the uh, Easter order forms that are part of your bulletin today. Uh, you can uh, fill those out. We're doing Easter lilies uh, only this year, so um, we invite you to get those orders in in the next couple of weeks so that we'll have Easter lilies on hand for our Easter Sunday celebration. But of course, before that, we'll have uh, Palm Sunday and Holy Week, so um, be, uh, be on the lookout for your March pathways that will have information about all that's uh, coming up here in the month of March and then uh, uh, how you can be a part of things. And one thing that you can be a part of uh, one last time today is our uh, Shrek Junior show that's happening at Kempton uh, Middle School, being put on by our Lakeview Intermediate S School students, three of which are uh, part of our uh, church family. So you can come out and enjoy that show. It's a good time, and uh, you won't be disappointed if you take some time this afternoon to be a part of that show. More information about everything's in your bulletin. Take a look at it and see how you can be a part of things. But let us turn our attention and be a part of this time of worship on this third Sunday of Lent. And as we do so, as we stand as you're able and join together in singing our gathering hymn. Let us sing together. Good morning, everybody. Welcome, everyone, for joining us at First Christian Church of Stowe, uh, those worshiping with us in person today, at home online, or watching later. Uh, our call to worship today, let our hearts be filled with peace, our words with love, and our spirits with hope. In a world often marked by chaos and uncertainty, let us be the beacons of God's peace, Spreading harmony wherever we go, let our love for one another be a testament to the transformative power of Christ's love within us, and may the hope that resides in our faith sustain us through every trial and tribulation. Together, let us lift our voices in worship, praising our Prince of Peace, the source of our, our love, and the giver of eternal hope. Let us join together in prayer. Gracious and merciful God, as we gather in your presence today, we come before you with hearts open to receive your peace, your love, and your hope. In a world often torn apart by conflict and division, we seek your peace that surpasses all understanding. Father, your love knows no bounds. It is a love that transcends differences, embraces the broken, and heals the wounded. Help us to embody this love in all that we do. In the midst of life's challenges and uncertainties, Lord, we cling to the hope that is found in you alone. May this hope 
anchor our souls, lifting our spirits and renewing our strength. As we embark in this time of worship, may your peace, love, and hope dwell richly among us. We pray all these things in, the Je in Jesus' name, our Prince of Peace, our eternal love and living hope. Amen. So I started this morning with uh, first service and gave them a pop quiz on the major themes, right, that I'm talking about this morning. Uh, so I, I told a couple that I wasn't going to do that again with you guys, but instead I'm going to ask you to participate in the themes that we have of peace, love, and hope. So you're assigned a role there. So our group over here, your guys' role is peace. So when I point at you, you got to say peace. Our middle group here, you guys are love group. And our smallest but mightiest group over here is hope. Very good, guys. Fantastic. So let's, let's see how this goes here. All right. When the world throws us hostility and hatred, we need to respond with peace. As the Beatles taught us, is all you need, and all you need is, and our, is a feeling of expectation and desire for certain things to happen, or a belief that something good will happen in the future. Involves optimism, confidence, and a sense of possibility, even in the challenge of uncertain times. So let us this morning share with each other the with each other. That was funny. Peace be with you. Peace be with you. Peace be with you. Hey, you guys had... Uh, peace be with you guys. Peace be with you guys. Yes, sir. Peace be with you guys. Yeah, peace be with you. I forgot about the top row up there. I meant to include them in hope, but that's okay. On which I build my shield and hiding place, my never ending treasury filled with boundless stores of grace. Jesus, my shepherd, brother, friend, my prophet, priest, and king, my Lord, my life, my way, my end, except the praise I bring. Oh, hail the power of Jesus' name, let angels prostrate fall, bring forth the royal diadem.
I want to invite our children forward for our children's message. <clears throat> Bar, thank you so much for a beautiful and rousing anthem there. And kudos to those that kept that beat. Wow. <laughs> Very impressive. Oh, right. Hello. All right. Now, now. <laughs> I'll get to that. <laughs> All right. All right. Sit down. Sit down. Sit back. Sit back. All right. It's good to okay, see sit you. Back, sit back. Sit back. All right. So one of my favorite verses in the Bible is from John 3.16. I bet you guys have heard it before. You guys know it? For God so loved the world that God gave God's only Son so that whoever believes in Him would not perish but have everlasting life right God's in that verse John is talking about how incredibly big God's love is for us right and so I was thinking about that verse and was wondering just how big and how great is God's love right and I wondered guys if we could measure it yeah right so this morning I brought some things that, uh, that we often use to measure stuff. Come on, guys. Now, all right? Right? So sometimes, when, so sometimes when we are making cookies, we use measuring cups, right? Because we want to make sure that we get... Yeah. We need a measuring cup if we're going to make cookies, right? So we measure out the flour and the sugar right? I wish I could measure the excitement you guys are showing right now, right? So we use measuring cups, right? Do you think we can use a measuring cup to measure God's love? No? no? Yes. You think? No. I don't know if we could. No. I mean, we could try, but listen to this, right? It says this in the Psalms, right? In Psalm 23, we read this, right? It says, and when the psalmist is talking about God's love, the psalmist says, my cup overflows. And well, this is only a, even a half a cup, yeah, right? So, so even if we had a cup, would, it, would just go. it would just overflow, right? Yeah. So a measuring well, cup's not going to do any good. Well, we could try that, but I don't even think that would work, like, right? That's right. Cup. Like an ice cream cup? I, yeah, we could try, but again, I think it would just overflow with ice cream, which wouldn't be a bad thing either, right? All right, so if we were going to build something, right, what well, we would take a measuring tape, right? And Right? So if we're going to build something, if we want to build a house, we want to make sure we measure everything properly, right? Do you think we can measure God's love with a measuring tape? You know what? I don't think we can either because the psalmist also says that God's love is higher than the heavens, right? And well, that's, that's, I mean, this only goes up to 16 feet. I don't think that's going to get even up to our ceiling, right? Yes, Not at all. Up to a different universe. I think you're right, right? All right, well, I got one more thing that we can, we measure things. A bear. Big as a bear. God's love is as big as a bear. I think it might even actually be bigger. I'm going to look that up in the Bible. But there's one other thing that I thought of that we could use to maybe measure, right? Uh -oh. We measure time with what? Watches and clocks, right? So that's how we measure time, right? And I know some people are out there right now measuring, you know, how long this church service might take, right? <laughs> Particularly when we get to the sermon, right? Okay, so I wonder, hey guys, we're not done yet. Do you guys think we can measure God's love with our watches and clocks? Yeah. Do you no. think we can? No. you think? Well, no. listen to this, right? The psalmist again says that God's love is from everlasting to everlasting. So that doesn't say um, that God's love is only from is only from 10.30 to 11.30 on Sundays, does it? Everlasting to everlasting is always and forever. So I don't think even my watch would, my watch kind of runs out of battery after a day or so. Yeah. It's never going to run forever, right? So I don't think we can even use our watches to measure God's love, right? 
That's right. God is a never-ending battery. Yeah, God's love is as big as a bear. You guys are teaching me all kinds of wonderful things here, right? So I don't think we can measure God's love, but I think the best thing for us to do is not try to measure it, but just experience it, right? And know that God's love is always going to be there for us, that it's always going to fill us up to overflowing, and that God's love is always going to be bigger and higher and around us forever and ever, and that God's love is never, ever going to run out of time. And that's the best way that we can experience it. And of course, we certainly want to share that with others. Will you guys pray with me? Dear God, your love is so great that you gave your only son so we could have eternal life. Thank you for your love, O oh God. Amen. Hey, guys. <laughs> challenge uh, this morning. I wrote a short story that I would like to share with us this morning. In a small, tightly knit community nestled in Stowe, Ohio, there lived a humble congregation that gathered each Sunday in a quaint, welcoming church. As the congregation continued to give faithfully, they witnessed the ripple effect of their generosity the church's outreach programs flourished, providing food and shelter to those in need. Families struggling to make ends meet found hope in the kindness of strangers, and the community grew stronger in unity and compassion. With each tithe and offering, the congregation experienced a profound sense of peace, knowing that they were making a difference in the lives of others. Love flowed freely in the congregation, binding them together in the shared mission of spreading God's word. Over time, the acts of love and faith inspired others to follow their examples. The church became a beacon of hope in the community, radiating God's love to all who crossed its threshold. And so the connection between love, peace, and hope was realized through the simple act of giving. For in giving, they found not only the means to support their church and community, but also the abundant blessings of love, peace, and hope that overflowed from generous hearts. And we know that our gifts that we make, whether it's in the offering plates or your donations directly to the church office, are multiplied through God's hands. So let us give faithfully and receive the love, hope, and peace that is shared to us. Let us now stand as you are able and join together in singing our offering hymn. Let us join together in prayer. 
Gracious God, as we gather in your presence today, we are reminded of your timeless words that speak of love, peace, and hope. From 1 Corinthians 13, 13, we are reminded, and now these three remain, faith, hope, and love, but the greatest of these is love. Lord, may our dedication be rooted in love as we strive to love you and one another with genuine hearts, reflecting your love in all we do. In John 14, verse 27, your son Jesus declares, peace I leave with you, My peace I give you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your heart be troubled and do not be afraid. May your peace, which surpasses all understanding, guide our hearts and our minds as we commit ourselves to your service. And from Romans 15, verse 13, we find assurance in your promise of hope. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Grant us the strength to hold fast in this hope, even in the face of trials, knowing that you are faithful to fulfill your promises. As we dedicate our lives, our talents, and our resources to your work, may your word be our guide, your love, our motivation, your peace, our anchor, and your hope, our sustaining force. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior and Redeemer, we pray. Amen. You may be seated. God's word for us today comes from the Gospel of John, 3rd chapter, verses 11 to 21. And this scripture reading for today is part of a larger conversation that is happening between Jesus and Nicodemus. Nicodemus, who is a Pharisee, and he's making a sincere effort, in spite of his, his position, to understand who Jesus is and how it is that Jesus does what he does, perform miracles and preach what he preaches. But Jesus, being Jesus, doesn't make things easy for Nicodemus. Each time Nicodemus asks a question, Jesus responds with a convoluted answer that requires us to go deeper and deeper to find its understanding. And at the point where we begin our reading for today, Jesus is trying to explain eternal life to Nicodemus by referencing a story from the Hebrew Scriptures about Moses and the Israelites during the time of their wilderness wandering. And we'll get into that, of course, more in a few moments. But first, hear this from the Gospel of John. Very truly, I tell you, we speak of what we know and testify to what we have seen. Yet you do not receive our testimony. If I have told you about earthly things and you do not believe, how can you believe if I tell you about heavenly things? No one has ascended into heaven except the one who descended from heaven, the Son of Man. And just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world, that God gave God's only Son, so that everyone who believes in him may not perish, but may have eternal life. Indeed, God did not send the Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Those who believe in him are not condemned, but those who do not believe are condemned already because they have not believed in the name of the only Son of God. And this is the judgment, that the light has come into the world and people love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. For all who do evil hate the light and do not come to the light so that their deeds may not be exposed. 
But those who do what is true come to the light so that it may be clearly seen that their deeds have been done in God. This is the good news. Thanks be to God. The story Jesus is referring to comes from the book of Numbers, chapter 21. The Israelites are still wandering in the desert after decades of travel, and they have gotten to the point where they are simply done. They've had it, they're tired, hungry, thirsty, and they are sick to death of eating just manna, the only food that is been provided for them for years. They complain and they accuse God and Moses of bringing them into the desert for the sole purpose of killing them, of letting them die. And what is God's response to all this complaining in the desert? Maybe a watery oasis with lounge chairs and fruity drinks and those little umbrellas? Maybe a food truck, perhaps. No, not at all. To God's chosen people who are floundering in the desert, God sends poisonous snakes to bite all the people. (laughs) Gotta love the Old Testament. And consequently, many of the Israelites die because of those bites from the poisonous snakes which, understandably, motivates the people to issue quick apologies and requests for immediate deliverance from the snakes, to which God complies. But how does God comply? By taking away the snakes? (laughs) No, no. This deliverance comes by God instructing Moses to make a bronze image of that poisonous snake, place it on a pole, and any time someone is bitten by a snake, they need only to make their way to that bronze snake on a pole, look it in the eye, and they'll be healed. Jesus uses this story from the Hebrew Scriptures to reference his impending crucifixion and resurrection. He explains to Nicodemus that in being lifted up, in hanging and dying on the cross, he will be like that serpent on the pole. Through him, the world will be healed. Just as the Israelites must look at the pole to be healed from their snake bite, Jesus is now saying, find healing from the bite of death today. That people need only to go to him to be healed from their sin and find new and renewed and eternal life. The statement is so important that Jesus repeats it in one of the most Famous and revered verses in the entire Bible. For God so loved the world that God gave God's only Son so that everyone who believes in him would not perish but would have everlasting life. This verse, so well known, so often repeated, is an invitation. It's an invitation to find healing. We are invited to believe in Jesus so that we can be healed of that which we will die from and find new and renewed life and then one day eternal life. We're not being passively herded into the kingdom of God, Jesus is saying. Rather, we are being invited. We are being encouraged to take an active role in our salvation. But to take an active role in our salvation means also, like the snake-bitten Israelites, we must take an active role in our healing. This invitation tells us something important about being beloved. We are God's beloved. That's our truth and we cannot change it. No matter 
what we always have been and we always will be beloved. However, we will enjoy our belovedness when we believe it, when we own it, and when we live into it. The more we recognize our belovedness, the more we will experience its benefits. Benefits like healing and gratitude and compassion and grace and forgiveness and love. We play an active role in owning our belovedness. We choose whether we accept it and we choose how we will live into it and from it. But what happens if we don't? When we deny we are beloved, there are actually a multitude of snake bites that threaten our lives. And perhaps the deadliest is the snake bites of judgment. Expand the vernacular of verses 17 and 18, and we hear Jesus explain this truth. Indeed, God did not send the Son into the world to condemn the world, to judge the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Those who believe in him are not condemned, not judged. But those who do not believe are condemned already, are judged already, because they have not believed in the name of the only Son of God. Often this is believed to sound harsh because Jesus begins talking about judgment and evil and wickedness. Statements we are familiar with, often used by fire and brimstone preachers who are trying to scare people into going to church and getting saved because God is going to rain fire and judgment down if we don't believe in Jesus. But that's not what this passage is saying. Jesus is describing what happens when we don't believe Jesus' message of our belovedness. Without the healing we find in Jesus, without the confirmation of our belovedness, the snake bites are fatal. When we don't believe we are beloved, we open ourselves up to self-loathing, fear, anxiety. As many of us have experienced such Adverse emotions and self-perceptions can then lead to a whole host of problems, broken relationships, violence, addiction, alienation, apathy, suicide, murder, poverty, war, ecological devastation, and on and on. So contrary to those fire and brimstone preachers, judgment and suffering come not from God, but from ourselves. We judge ourselves when we determine we are not worthy of being loved. We cause our own suffering when we live out of this place of unbelovedness. And that is why it is so vital to believe Jesus. Our very lives and the fate of creation all depend on Upon it. For us to care about ourselves, about others, and the rest of creation, we have to recognize and claim our belovedness. But as we're learning throughout this Lenten season, owning our belovedness is always a process. And a significant part of that process is stillness. To recognize and claim our belovedness, we need to be still. So that in that stillness, we can seize another critical piece of that process. Healing. To recognize and claim our belovedness, we need to find healing. Healing from pain and trauma, 
healing from the lies and messages we received and internalized that were not good enough, healing of our relationships with our bodies, healing of our relationships with others, and perhaps most importantly, healing of our understanding of who God is. When it came to healing from the snake bites that the Israelites suffered, God could have chosen anything for Moses to craft and put on a pole for the people to go and look at. God could have had Moses make as a focus a flower or a rainbow or a fluffy little bunny. But instead, God chose a snake. And God chose the snake because snakes represent so much for us as people of faith. The serpent that tempted Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. An animal that is threatening and can inflict great pain and suffering and even death. An animal that will try to fool us with cute and innocent sounding names like garter snake even though all snakes slither directly out of the depths of hell. Okay, perhaps I'm letting my own personal proclivities towards snakes influence that last point. I hate snakes. (laughs) Nothing sends me running like a little child screaming than a little garter snake. But nonetheless, the snake is an important symbol for talking about healing. Because while we all want to be healed, few of us are eager to go through the process of healing. Healing is difficult. It's painful. It's messy. Whether our healing requires surgery or multiple rounds of radiation, whether it needs a cast or physical therapy, or whether it means working through traumatic memories and long repressed emotions. Healing takes time. Healing takes effort. And most of all, healing takes a lot of courage. By having Moses make a snake, God is telling us we will need to face our pain, to be healed. But that's the only way. God is asking us to be brave, but God is also reminding us God will be with us in our healing. In the person of Jesus, God is lifted up on the cross for all of us to see, bearing our fears and our heartaches and our sin. And what we see when we look is that God will bear all of this for us and with us so healing and belovedness can be found. When we focus on the God who brings us to the place of our belovedness, that is when we will be able to be healed. Now, healing will always look different for each person. So I cannot offer a prescription. But I can say healing begins with Stillness. The stillness in the presence of God. And if I sound like a broken record about all this stillness, it's with good reason. Recovering the truth of our belovedness begins and ends in stillness because that is where we break through the noise. That is where we find God and discover our truth. That is why stillness is the way to awareness, to listening, and now to healing. Healing from trauma and loss, healing from broken relationships, healing from betrayal, maybe committed against us or betrayal we ourselves committed. Healing from trying and failing or healing from failing even try. 
And this is why we return to stillness again and again, to be with Jesus and to hear and see and experience again His truth and promises. To sit with God and to allow God to redeem our pain and remind us we are beloved. Because from that place of stillness, we can begin and begin again living as those who are beloved. There's no doubt God could have simplified all of life by having us born knowing we are beloved. But if that were the case, we would likely take our belovedness for granted and the snakes of judgment and death would still bite us. We'd miss out on the journey and the opportunity to discover and question and test and own and revel in our belovedness. Our path in life always includes judgment and it always includes brokenness. But when we walk any path aware of our divinely given belovedness, Our path always includes healing. And healing leads to gratitude, compassion, grace, forgiveness, and love. And love leads to eternal life. So when we believe we are beloved and live as beloved people, that is when we begin to be healed. And when we achieve this healing, we can then help others begin to understand they are beloved, which will put them on a path of healing and not of judgment. This is how the world can be healed. And this is how we are called into healing. We are participants in God's act of healing. May we never forget to participate. Amen. Friends, let's go to God again through our prayers. Let us pray. Beloved God, whether we can begin to understand the analogy between Jesus on the cross and the serpent on a pole from Moses, we know we are still invited, invited by you to take an active role of accepting and owning our belovedness and then helping guide others to know theirs as well. And for this invitation, we give thanks because we live in a world that surrounds us with judgment. Judgment is a natural consequence of just getting out of bed every morning, deciding what we will eat or what we will wear. In everything, there is judgment. We are judged by our driving, by the work we do, by who we vote for, whether or not we go to church on Sunday morning, and if we do, what kind of church we go to. And if our cultural judgment wasn't already enough, we heap upon ourselves self-judgment, Or we tell ourselves we are not good enough, not smart enough, not rich enough, not enough to measure up to others. God of love, help us to see Jesus, your beloved Son, lifted on the cross, laid in a tomb, but then again lifted into new life so that judgment would never, ever keep us from finding healing, wholeness, and our belovedness. Help us to see judgment as a sign of needing healing. Help us to see where we experience self-judgment or judgment of others so that in the stillness of your presence, we let go of this cold and harsh practice that only takes us away from that which is good. Help us to reach a point in our belovedness where we are able and confident to guide others to recognize their belovedness helping them to find healing from their brokenness and to know, too, they are your holy and beloved child. 
For this is how true healing comes to your world and to all of your children. We ask that you listen now to the prayers we lift to you in this time of stillness and holy silence. All this we pray in the name of your only begotten Son, Jesus the Christ, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our debts, as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not in temptation, deliver us from evil. Thy is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Friends, let us respond to God's invitation to gather together at our Lord's table. And let us do so as we sing together our communion hymn. Every time we step to this table, we are responding to Christ's invitation. To Jesus' invitation to participate in the healing of our lives, of our spirits, in the healing of our world. Because every time we come to this table, we look at our Lord and Savior. We look at his brokenness and see that in his brokenness, there is healing. And in that healing, there is unconditional love and forgiveness and grace and new life. So let us come to this table just as we are, broken as we may be, knowing that here, that brokenness, and be healed. And that when we go forth from this table, we are able to again participate. Participate by sharing a word of hope, a word of encouragement, a word of invitation that all the world is invited to look upon Jesus and find healing.
It was on that night before Jesus was crucified that he gathered with his disciples for a meal. And it was during that meal that he took a loaf of bread and he blessed it and broke it and he gave it to his disciples and he said to them, Take and eat of this, all of you. For this bread is my body, broken for you. Take and eat of it and do this in remembrance of me. And in like manner, Jesus took a cup and he gave it to his disciples and he said to them, Take and drink from this, all of you. For this cup is my shed blood, poured out for the forgiveness of your sins. Take and drink of it and do this in remembrance of me. Friends, let us come to this table and receive its gifts. The bread of life and the cup of salvation. The gifts of God for the children of God. Let us join in prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we know each week this table is set before us to allow us to come and partake in the bread and the cup in the forgiveness of our sins. And we know that we were so loved that You sent Your only Son, Jesus, as a sacrifice for us. By Your guiding hands, please lead us in the love, peace, and hope of our daily lives. In Your heavenly name we pray. Amen. The invitation for us to participate in God's healing of the world is always before us. So let us hear that invitation. Let us consider our response and let us do that as we sing together our hymn of invitation. Hymn number 552 verses 1, 2, and 3, standing on the promises. Let us sing together.
<laughs> standing on so many promises of God. And that is what God offers us. The opportunity to stand on those truths, on those promises, to know that no matter what, God is there with us. God is there to offer healing. God is there to offer us comfort. God is even there for us to run into God's arms when we see a snake. Whatever the snake may be, metaphorical or actual. So let us go forth understanding that truth, owning that truth, clinging to that truth, and living forth from that truth. For when we do, others will see that. And others will wonder how it is in this world of judgment that we are able to live with such promises and such truth. Well, maybe then that we share with them how it is. And that they too can begin to learn how it is for their life. Maybe right here on a Sunday morning or finding us online. That is how we participate in the healing of the world. So let us go forth to be active participants. And as you do, go forth to participate. May the grace of God, the constant and abiding presence of the Holy Spirit, and the unconditional love of Jesus Christ rest and abide with each and every one of you, now and forevermore. Amen. Amen.